I have Jesus all tied up. And Joseph, you can't have him. This is the stern pronouncement that one father recently heard from his son that was playing in the next room. It seems that this five-year-old had his transformer set and all of his other toys mixed up with the family's nativity set. And the father didn't want to go in and spoil all of the action, but he was left wondering if Fisher-Price toys had made a Herod figure so that it could say the same thing that the transformer did. I have Jesus all tied up. <coughs> we want this expression to guide the direction of our lesson today. Now, you know that we wrap up gifts to hide their identity. <coughs> and we don't want the receiver to know what the gift is ahead of time. You see, that spoils the gift if we know what it is ahead of time. And it robs the giver of the joy of knowing. Last Christmas, uh, I noticed in our family, we forgot to put the names on two packages. And it was kind of funny how it got mixed up. A guy gets a facial kit and a gal gets a tool. Now, aren't you thankful that God doesn't get our gifts mixed up for us? His gift of Jesus has our name on it, and it is exactly what we need. And he doesn't have to be embarrassed that he got anything mixed up. In the process of gift wrapping, we make sure that everything is appropriately tied up. You see, it wouldn't do for someone to peek and to know ahead of time what the gift is. Uh, I'm amazed when I watch people wrap gifts. There's all ways that you can... Uh, tie up a bow, curl the ribbons, you can twist them, just about do anything and mix and match colors. When we talk about Jesus being the gift, um, I was intrigued with Tom's comment at giving when we were able to contribute a minute ago. Do you realize that so many people this time of year, probably for the first time during the year, begin to make the connection between giving and God's ultimate gift of Jesus Christ. Christians of all people should be the most giving because we have received the greatest gift on the face of the earth. When Jesus came as the long-awaited Messiah, his reception was less than cordial by a lot of people. And consequently on purpose... Jesus tried to hide sometimes who he really was. When seeing Jesus through the eyes of Mark, we encounter what is called the messianic secret. It's on purpose. Jesus tells people, I don't want you to spread the news about who you think I am because he knew that the vast majority of people weren't ready for him. In the New Testament, Jesus commands silences in many instances. For example, Mark 8, 29 and 30. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, you're the Christ. And he charged them that they shouldn't tell anyone. Jesus also says this in Mark 1, 43 through 45, after the cleansing of a leper. After sternly warning that leper, he sent him away at once saying, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded, a testimony to them. This concept also we find in Jesus' parables and teaching. Mark chapter 4, verse 11, he said to them, Unto you is given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside and don't understand, all things are done in parables. But you see, the identity of Jesus wouldn't stay tied up forever. This is in spite of the fact human beings for centuries have tried to put limits on Jesus. From the gospel writers, we learn from the outset that people tried to pass off the false narrative that Jesus didn't come from the dead. Listen to Matthew's account. This is chapter 28, beginning verse 11. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city 
and told the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Now you tell the people, his disciples came by night and stole away his body while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, uh, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and they did like they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. You see, some people thought that Jesus was a liar or a lunatic at best. On one occasion, his family thought he was a little touched in the head. And so they went out in the crowds to retrieve him. They wanted to save family face and family name. Some claimed he didn't really perform miracles. All that he really was doing was working for the prince of devils, Beelzebub. But Jesus challenged the view and he asked, now, if that's true, doesn't that mean that it's a house divided against itself? And how can a house divided against itself really stand? Time up to tame him. No one likes to have Jesus on the loose. No telling what tradition he might violate or faux pas he might commit. Kind of like the swine going into the sea. An untethered Jesus scares people. You remember Mark's story about that? In Mark chapter 5, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with chains. For he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, and he tore the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was crying, and he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran, down, he ran and he fell down in front of Jesus, and he cried out with a loud voice, and he said, Jesus, what do you have to do with me? Your son of the most high God. I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion. You see, after he was healed, the people in the town were scared. They didn't want Jesus around anymore. They begged him, go, go. Jesus' family did have him for a few years, though. He no, uh, no doubt was influenced by his family, and he influenced others out of his home setting. Now, for me, I don't know about you, Christmas is not Christmas without the family seeing three important movies. First one is It's a Wonderful Life. Got to see that one. Second one is Miracle on 34th Street. That's the second one. A third one is some version of Scrooge, and I have my own that I really like. And when I watch these three movies in a four-week period in December, I feel like I'm now ready for the Christmas spirit. But when I miss one, I kind of feel like something's missing. Now, the reason I mention these three is because the main point of It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart gets to a low point in the movie where he actually utters the words impetuously, I wish I'd never been born. Well, the movie then moves into a time warp. And that's where his guardian angel, Clarence, pointing out what life would have been like had he not been born. And he's sort of shocked because he discovers how many people his life has touched or not touched, whatever the case. I was watching... Miracle on 34th Street the other night. It was one of those cold, dark, rainy evenings when I got home. And when I got home, uh, Nancy had on the stove oh, a wonderful bowl of chicken or vegetable chicken soup. And so I settled down in my chair and had my, 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 my lap cover on me and my warm bowl of soup. And took a couple of sips of the wonderful broth, getting ready to finish watching all of the story of It's a Wonderful Life. And all of a sudden, the unthinkable happened. Out of the blue, like the blink of an eye, a speeding bullet, 
Soup and broken pieces of bowl were on the floor in front of me. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> and it ruined my watching my movie. I remarked to Nancy, it went from it's a wonderful life to a, it's a messy life real quick. You know, life is messy. Sometimes it does mess with our comfortable traditions. I suspect that in Jesus' home life, he saw the messiness of life. I wish we had all those detail, details. I suspect he saw some conflict between Mary and Joseph. I suspect he heard angry words from siblings. But Joseph and Mary did have Jesus for a little while. They had him long enough to train him up and to bring him up. Listen to what Luke says. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now this growth may be parallel to the statement in John 1 and verse 80. He grew and became strong in spirit. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. You see, during Christmas time, it may be hard to keep priorities and perspectives on things. Sometimes home is not what it ought to be. It's where possessions and toys grow and become strong. Instead of Christmas time being a time of family where character is reiterated and where we re-emphasize what is important. Becoming spiritually strong, filled with wisdom, and having God's grace on us should determine our approach to this holiday season. If we keep Christ in Christmas, as some say we should, does that mean that Christmas keeping will look any different for the Christian than it will be for the non-Christian? Well, certainly Herod couldn't have Jesus on his own terms. I was struck in my earlier years and I think one time I had a lesson on how my view of the Bible has changed. I still have my original Bible that my parents gave me when I was six years old, leather bound, and it's got all kinds of interesting notes and things on it. What I do remember when I was younger, going through the earlier chapters of Matthew and just struck at how Matthew says, Herod wanted to know all these little details about Jesus because he wanted to worship him. And as I read through the story, I remember being shocked. Well, Herod didn't really want to worship him. He had another agenda. And Matthew's clear about that. I was like, oh, Herod couldn't have Jesus on his own terms, though he wanted. Matthew 2 Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, I want you to go and search diligently for the child. When you found him, bring me word because I too want to come and worship him. But we find out from Matthew, that's not what Herod wanted to do. Herod the Great wasn't acting so great here. Now when they had departed... Matthew says, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And he said, rise, take up the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there till I tell you. Herod is about to search for the child and destroy him. So he rose up, he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod so that it could be fulfilled. That was spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, he became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all the region around there, two years old and under, according to the time that ascertained from the wise men. And then, of course, that was fulfilled. What was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, a voice was heard in Ramah, Weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Now, we usually don't associate murder, furious anger, and wholesale slaughter of male babies under two years old with Christmas. Uh, the other day I went in the store, walked down two aisles, two long aisles. All kinds of Christmas tree ornaments. Have, have you been surprised over the years what has become Christmas ornaments you hang on the tree? It's just amazing. What I did notice was 
and it was absent. I didn't see an ornament for King Herod. <laughs> I don't know that anybody wants to hang on their tree King Herod. He doesn't get the kind of press that you would want someone to get. No one's going to have King Herod hanging around. But what's interesting is Matthew tells the story, Herod certainly couldn't have Jesus on his terms. Neither can we. What does it mean for us then to untie Jesus? We need to free him up from our expectations. The Jews had theirs. They had the Jewish messianic hope. And they thought that there was going to come a leader that sort of fulfilled their idea of this warrior hero, liberator, great movement leader. In fact, Philo of Alexandria, probably best than anyone, sums up that expectation. Listen to, listen to what, uh, or the picture that he paints for this Messiah. For a man will go forth who leads the field of battle, and he'll wage war, and he'll overcome great and populous nations, because God himself sends him to his holy ones. And this leader will possess moral courage and he'll have physical strength of the highest order. So that's how Philo saw it. But we need to free Jesus up from our own biases and prejudices. God doesn't want us to have a sanitized Jesus that remains in the creche that's hanging on the Christmas tree as an ornament. If we keep Jesus in the manger, then we can manage him. Because you see, he neither threatens nor dictates to us in that mode. But we need to free him up from traditions that bind. What we're called to do is accept Jesus on his own terms. Untie him from our prejudices, our biases, our traditions and expectations that keep him from being who he came to be. I have Jesus all tied up. And Joseph, you can't have him. Well... We need to untie Jesus and let the transformer toys know who's in charge. Joseph released him as a faithful father to the world. But neither Joseph, Herod, or the five-year-old could have Jesus all tied up. He's for the ages. And it may be this morning that it's the time for each one of us to untie Jesus from our expectations. Because we can't have him. It's actually the opposite. He wants to have us. So if you need to come to Jesus, this baby in the manger, that during this month as we think about this, it sort of leads to Easter time, doesn't it? The resurrection. Boy, I am so glad he didn't... St have you ever heard this comment? You see someone's baby, uh, maybe a grandchild, you look at it and you go, oh, they're so cute. I wish they stayed that way forever. Well, aren't you glad Jesus didn't stay the baby forever? He came to earth with a mission and he didn't meet others' expectations. He says very clearly, I came to do the will of my Father. And so this morning, if you need to give your life to this Jesus that's not all tied up, in fact, he gave it all so that we could give our all to God. If you need to come to him this morning and do so with a heart of submission and repentance, and obedience, and love, and dedication. Won't you do it while we stand and sing?